Let's start recording. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Meet City. Today, we have David Pornacorsi, a, a real estate lawyer, uh, and we'll be talking about the moratorium effects on commercial real, uh, commercial real estate market trends and his future outlook. Let's welcome David. Good afternoon. Good day, Cindy. Thank you. So yeah, uh, David, uh, just give a quick intro about yourself. Sure. I've uh, uh, been practicing law in the Fremont, Newark area since the late 80s, but I've also been involved in public advocacy as well as public service. 10 years on the Fremont Planning Commission. I served two years on the Fremont City Council. So I've dealt with um, various issues affecting both residential and commercial properties from a public policy perspective. And really since the pandemic, in a, uh, beginning in April of last year, I've probably given over a dozen uh, webinars to various real estate groups and other interest groups on primarily residential, but also on commercial moratoriums. So I've been following the events uh, very closely around the Bay Area. So I'm very excited to talk about the new phase that we're entering into with commercial moratoriums now that we're phasing out of the uh, moratorium uh, uh, aspects of, at least for commercial properties. Great, thank you so much for uh, sharing that. So uh, yeah, uh, let's, let's, let's dive into the moratorium, yeah. Let me talk about it. Yes, beginning in uh, March of last year, uh, the governor um, issued a lot of executive orders and emergency proclamations. And one of the executive orders he issued authorized counties and cities to be able to enact uh, eviction moratoriums uh, for both commercial and residential. And this is new because ordinarily, Commercial uh, real estate is governed by written lease agreements and it's governed by state law. Uh, so for the very first time that in my memory and in all the years I've been practicing law, because of the concerns over the pandemic and the huge dislocation in the marketplace that was to occur with lockdowns and companies not being able to operate, the governor allowed counties and cities to enact these moratoriums. So the governor, uh, eventually, by September of 2020, um, the state finally stepped in and uh, created some statewide rules regarding residential properties and residential leases, uh, but it left it only to the governor to allow the cities and counties to remain in the arena of regulating commercial leases. And the governor kept issuing executive orders that had dates that were expiring in which the counties and cities would no longer be able to regulate in this area. And the last extension that he had by executive order uh, was until September 30th. And it expired and he did not extend it any further. So what does that mean? That means that uh, a county and city, if they wanted to regulate now uh, to stop evictions of commercial tenants, no longer can legally be able to do it. And what happens to the moratoriums that were in place? Well, it depends. Um, in Santa Clara County, and again, if you've got commercial property, you really need to know which county and city you're in. And I want to provide my normal disclaimer that I'm not offering legal advice here. You need to consult with an attorney to get formal advice to rely upon it. But in general terms, Santa Clara County had initiated uh, had enacted a countywide moratorium that applied in the cities, unless the cities had a stronger moratorium uh, to protect commercial tenants. And that moratorium expired on August 18th. Um, and during that period, for so from basically March of 2020 through August 1st, if rent was due on the first of the month of August 2021, if you were a commercial tenant you, and you had COVID related expenses or a downturn, substantial downturn in your business because of COVID, the landlord is supposed to give you a time to defer that payment. Now that the moratorium has expired in Santa Clara County for all that past rent, it's now gonna be due and I believe it's due over a six month period of time uh, set forth in the ordinance. So that is now gonna be coming due plus 
on September 1st, if you're a commercial tenant in Santa Clara County that was governed by that moratorium, you got to pay your full rent now. So that's Santa Clara County, but I'm also living in, uh, and practicing law in the Fremont Newark area. Fremont, Newark, and Berkeley are outliers because they had a tail to their moratorium, which meant that even though the governor has said the counties cannot enact any new moratoriums or change their moratoriums, the moratoriums in Newark, Fremont, and Berkeley continue to remain in effect as long as and there is an emergency declaration of COVID in place. For example, in the county of in the city of Newark, it's the later of the local declaration of an emergency or the governor's declaration of emergency, whichever is later. And right now we're still considered a COVID emergency and that may stay uh, for some time. So if you're a tenant in Newark, for example, you can still defer your rent in September, October, November for as long as the moratorium's in effect. So it's a patchwork set of laws laws and expectations. And depending upon if you are a commercial tenant or a commercial landlord, you need to consult your local uh, county and citywide ordinances to see uh, what the impact is on your moratorium. Okay. Um, so earlier we talked about, you know, like how you were talking to your commercial agents. Uh, do you want to Sure. sure, yes. <laughs> you know, as any good attorney will do, sometimes you don't know all the answers. And so you challenge me with saying, well, what's the real estate investment um, uh, landscape look like? Mm -hmm. And I talked to my go-to guy, who's Tim, and Tri uh, Tim Tran of the Ivy Group, who's a commercial real estate broker of many, many years. And I was coming in thinking, well, we're in a pandemic. You know, we have this, these, we hear about the great resignations where people are uh, not working uh, at all. And uh, let me, before I tell you what he said, um, you know, in, even, even in my own situation, I've been asked, uh, looking for uh, a, a additional administrative staff. We're beefing up, we're trying to hire a new legal administrative assistant. And we, for the first time ever, we had to go outside the normal ways that we would try to find new work because we weren't getting good candidates. And I had this outside consultant uh, tell me, a job placement consultant say that, you know, that not only do you have, that, that the, by, uh, the workers, the, the empl potential employees are demanding more, that you often are asked to pay a premium to employees to tell them to actually show up and work, which to me was shocking. You know, for all these years, yes, I'll be there at eight. Yes, I'll be at nine, I'll punch in. And now employees are sitting, or potential employees are sitting with sidelines. Well, yeah, I will work, but if you want me to actually show up and see you in person, I want more per hour. So uh, I think that's going to change. But I was thinking, well, gee, how is that going to writ large in the commercial arena? So my thought was with the moratoriums being lifted, tenants being dislocated, all of those things, I thought it was a soft commercial market. Uh, Tim's his experience is last year, certainly it was, but now people and investors are anticipating right now that even though technically we're in a pandemic, there's this huge uh, demand for rental space, commercial rental space, small uh, uh, spaces to you know uh, uh, warehouse size spaces. We have a new place in uh, Fremont that I had approved of when I was in council called Pacific Commons South. And those are all industrial warehouses, condo, condo eyes, you can buy individual units. And those are going very well. You know, and I asked him, well, why? You know, because of all these other things, he says, again, there's pent up investment demand. There's, he's, he's trying as a, as a buyer, he's had to compete with two or three other buyers for the same unit. He says, this is the hottest he's seen in many, many years. So uh, it just shows that the, there is still a real bullish market where we have jobs being uh, made available and the expectation that this phase that we're running into right now with the great resignation is gonna be a passing phase and employers will be able to demand again that employees show up to work. So I was, I was floored. Um, I was really surprised to hear this, but um, he's saying, no, I've I'm, I'm been trying to, he had, what's, what else is happening, I can tell anecdotally, and he said the same thing. 
I had a, a, I have a client that had a major office presence near the Fremont Park Station in downtown Fremont. And because of the uh, pandemic and people working remotely, he's moved his operations from there to a 5,000 square foot space off of Christie Street in Fremont, much smaller. He only goes in periodically. They have these, these shift schedules where they may be in only one or two days a week. So it's there's all of this movement around in the marketplace, and yet the demand is still exceeding the availability of space. Oh, wow. So basically- Isn't that amazing? To yeah, no, the story saying... that he related was similar. It sounded like Tesla. But it's uh, but it isn't Tesla. He, he wouldn't mention the client, but it was a Fremont-based client that, for tax reasons, was moving to Texas. But they still wanted to have a presence in Fremont. Uh, they wanted to have a presence in California. So even though you may be hearing some stories of people moving their or businesses moving out of Texas, and I think they're overblown. There's some headline stories. They still maintain a presence in in California because of the cachet being close to Silicon Valley. Um, my other my other client, for example, instead of having the cachet of a large office space near Bart, not only moved his office space to a smaller place on, on Christie Street, but he now has one of these flex spaces on one market plaza in San Francisco. So it's a situation where you're able to, to have a, a presence without necessarily having physical presence unless somebody says, I want to meet you. I'm coming in, flying into SFO. Can we meet in the city? Absolutely. So people are having uh, an interesting relationship between work, geography, physical presence, the ability like you and I are doing today to having this Zoom cast. So it's a much more fluid environment. And I think it's really exciting. Mm. So you're saying that uh, the, the people who are who own or uh, rent bigger spaces are now downsizing. And so the smaller spaces have a lot of demand. That's correct. That's how, correct. How about the bigger spaces? Well, that's what I was surprised at. Here's the space that I think that, you know, they can be compartmentalized. They can be made into smaller, partitioned off into smaller units as well. So there's some flexibility. I think landlords are going to have to, uh, to show if they're not getting the, the larger footprint of a tenant that they may be able, in order to um, maximize uh, their rentals, may have to uh, 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 permit new tenants to do TI, tenant improvements to create partition space. Um, so those are things that are that, that are happening right now, which I think are fascinating. Yeah, totally. I didn't, I didn't expect that. Um, I thought, I thought like these offices are probably rezoned to multi-family or something, the apartment and condos. Mm -hmm. Well, that's going to be, you know, if there's failing retail and large space, I mean, we had the uh, sad incident of a, a bowling alley in Fremont. I mean, I fought hard to try to preserve it, uh, but that, that, uh, that, that fight was lost because in part, the tenant had to, to shut down the bowling alley during the pandemic. So even though the lease was going to terminate there might have been some movement to try to preserve the space as long as the tenant was there and, and now he's gone. And so that whole space is eventually going to be developed. The other thing you're seeing for tenants that have failed in their own business. And one of the things that I think that, you know, for your, your, your uh, listeners, your viewers here, one of the things I think is shocking for small businesses as they're coming into their first business full of enthusiasm, full of uh, energy is that when you enter into a commercial lease, they're oftentimes five-year or 10-year leases. And so most, you know, most businesses do not succeed. A lot, what we have in Silicon Valley is a lot of people that try and fail, try and fail, and they maybe third or fourth time, they get the angel investors, they really launch. But if you fail in a long-term lease, what happens? Well, your, your LLC or your corporation may have no more assets and out of business, but you have a, a huge tail on your lease of maybe five or six years on your lease. The landlord can come after you. Well, how does he come after you or she come after you? Typically, you're asked to sign personal guarantees. So now your own personal assets are on the line and whatever protections you might have had that you thought with an LLC or corporation is against the whole world doesn't apply to your landlord who can come after you directly. So what's happening now uh, is 
two things. One, if the landlords think it's a hot enough market, they may be uh, willing to work out a termination of the agreement and just be able to lease out the space to another tenant that's more credit worthy, that's going to pay the rent on time. That's an ideal situation. The landlord isn't budging because it's a hot market. Uh, my friend at the Ivy Group, Tim Tan, was saying there is now a real spike in subleases. So you can have a tenant that's failing, basically outsourcing the rental obligation to a sublease, sub lessee, uh, getting landlord's consent, having that person come in, that business come in and fill in the uh, uh, rental obligation. So it relieves the tenant of that obligation they can't pay because they're not, they're out of business. So there's a lot of creative ways to avoid that uh, problem. And, and again, this is another thing where um, even if there's been pandemic effects, the economy is such that there are other businesses that are coming in to use those spaces. Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, what, where do you think, uh, what's your future outlook of commercial real estate space and um, what are the trends that you're seeing um, that are, you know, that people, most people don't expect? Well, I didn't expect these trends as being as positive as they are, but I think there is an outer limit. And I do think this is a larger discussion that we may have touched upon in our prior uh, interviews that you had with me. Uh, you know, we can uh, bemoan Tesla moving to Texas and we can you know, argue why did Elon do that? But keep in mind, Fremont will remind you that his manufacturing of the Teslas remain in Fremont. But there is an outer limit that if we're going to be growing jobs um, and not have housing meet up with jobs, eventually there's going to be a breaking point where there's not enough affordable housing for the employee base. Now, it, one of the things that may militate against that, what they, that may lessen the sin back commuting and that people are not expected to have to show up to work all the time. My son works at Google, for example. He hasn't, he has had a continuous job through the pandemic, but he hasn't had to show up to work since March of 2020. And Google is not expecting him to return until January of next year. So if you begin to have these business models, it may lessen the pressure on local rental, local housing, but we still have a huge demand. Our infrastructure uh, needs haven't kept up. The ability to get around the Bay Area other than in a vehicle are limited. And so we need to beef those things up. And so, you know, next five to 10 years, it's still perhaps a, a, an ascendant rise because of all the advantages that we have in Silicon Valley uh, next to uh, great campuses like Stanford and Berkeley and my own alma mater, Santa Clara University, pr producing these wonderful engineers and innovators. And we are a really uh, welcoming community for immigrants, from all over the world that in the Bay Area, at least, they, uh, they can succeed and flourish. Uh, those are great advantages you're not going to find in Texas or Idaho or uh, other places around the country that still give us a huge uh, advantage in terms of attracting the best talent and the best businesses. But, you know, in 10 to 15 years, maybe we reach that, that breaking point where it's just not sustainable to have a workforce that can afford to live here anymore if they're rent burdened more than 30 to 35 percent. And certainly, you know, we're already seeing that with our, our retail and our teachers and our police officers. So we need to have, if we want to continue to have uh, a job creating Silicon Valley, and I know that Facebook is doing its part and Google is doing its part by developing their own affordable housing, we really need to have uh, a concerted effort and a consensus to develop uh, the housing that we need across the income spectrum. Uh, spectrum, including below market rate housing. So those are the trend lines. These are the cautionary notes that I see from my from my perch. Okay. So um, any uh, tips or advice for um, for expiring commercial real estate investors? Uh, you, for leases that are expiring, expiring. Oh, yeah. as, uh, oh aspiring commercial investors. Okay. Yes, yeah. aspiring. Well, what I would, would try to do is if I were an investor in a business, in a lease, I would try to have a, maybe a relatively short window if you can negotiate it of three-year leases with options to extend. 
so that if you completely catapult and crash, that the future liability is such that you uh, you have a way of containing your risks, you're discounting your risks, uh, or else potentially being in, in a good sublease environment for a while and then using that to a point of expiration, then saying to the tenant, can I step up and be the, uh, uh, saying to the landlord, can I be your tenant now? So as being aspiring is to be strategic on the front end by not overburdening yourself with lease obligations that itself uh, prescribe uh, how your success, you know, maybe perhaps being creative on uh, if, if you're generating product for sales immediately, you know, a hybrid uh, combination of a base rent plus a percentage of profits so uh -huh. that the landlord becomes like essentially an investor in your success. And if you are successful, creates a dynamic where you have a very positive relationship, a win-win relationship with the landlord. Okay, how about how about people who are thinking of buying uh, buying or like uh, investing in REIT REITs, you know, uh, or even buying commercial properties? Well, it depends where the REITs are, uh, you know, because they all have different portfolios. I can't speak nationally whether there's softness in the market elsewhere. But if there were REITs or other investment vehicles that were really tailored to the Bay Area, I'd say, you know, again, I'm not a financial advisor, but I'd say your 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 chances of a of a return on investment are are pretty good here. In the Bay, right? In the Bay Area, at least. But this is where I know. I don't want to speak to to uh, the state of Washington or Seattle, uh, although that may be a very positive area because I'll tell you, in Seattle, they've had a council up there that has been very aggressive in building apartments. And the rentals for apartments have gone down about 20% because supply has gone up. So that may be a very attractive place for young workers, uh, for the Microsofts of the world, for the Boeings of the world to be able to move in and, and not have uh, burdened rents. So you need to look at the whole picture, uh, but um, there are some, I would imagine there are some great opportunities now. Okay. So yeah, uh, this uh, this is unexpected, but um, <laughs> uh, I have uh, I have some surprise questions for you. Uh oh. <laughs> yeah, uh, if you know, uh, if you have a choice between two superpowers, you know, uh, being invisible but you really smell bad, or flying being able to fly. So which one would you choose? Well, I don't like smelling bad, so I'd fly. <laughs> okay. Because so, I wouldn't be so invisible to the nose if I had smelled bad. At least if I can fly, I can fly over any issue. So I'd rather be able to fly. That, that'd be a what wonderful- if, What if you also smell bad? <laughs> if I also smell bad? Well, then I'd fly because then I go so high that nobody on the ground would be able to smell me. How about that? <laughs> That's a real surprise question. Now I'm waiting for the psychological profile that you're going to come up with. <laughs> <laughs> okay, another one. Uh, if you know uh, we finished the interview and you step outside of the office and then you find a lottery ticket and you want ten million, what would you do? Ah, that's a great question. Um, I would either do one of two things. I would either self-fund for a run for office or uh, you know, certainly pay for my daughter's college education, pay off the house, uh, and then uh, have extended uh, Buddhist retreats uh, and meditate for, and, and, have, and not worry about my finances while I'm doing it. Oh, okay. So you want to start a spiritual... Uh... Sure. So... So there's either a political journey that would be completely self-funded or, uh, or uh, uh, there's a wonderful uh, um, Spirit Rock Meditation Center up in Marin County um, that I would visit frequently. Oh, which one is it? It's in, uh, it's in uh, Marin County. What's the name? Yeah, Spirit Rock Meditation. So it's, uh, it's a generalized ecumenical uh, uh, retreat center for uh, uh, Buddhism. Great, I'm also Buddhist. And then, and then also, because of my Catholic tradition, I probably go to 
the Trappist Monastery in Gethsemane, Kentucky, uh, where a great American Catholic uh, author, Thomas Merton, uh, spent many years. So I could do that too. Could tour great Catholic monasteries around the world. All right, that was fun, right? Yep. <laughs> Unexpected. You know, yeah, all these surprise questions. You didn't tell me you're going to ask these questions. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's meant to be a surprise. I'm on my toes here now. It's meant to be a surprise, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's no fun if I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, any last final thoughts and how, um, please tell the audience how they can reach you. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy, again for this opportunity. I think that with anything in life, you need to be flexible. You need to uh, not uh, base your, your research on assumptions, but actually do your work. And I think in this commercial arena, because it's so fluid, as I just did, I reached out to an expert and it's always good to have a team of consultants whenever you're making an investment, not just only your financial advisor, your real estate agent, but if you're, if you're investing in a building, make sure you have your soils and technical support. So you, you minimize your risk. So that's my last tip is if you're, if you're uh, investing, uh, make sure you have a full team and not be worried to spend and also to spend on an attorney. I know that's self-serving, but I often handed leases after they've been negotiated and there's a dispute and they did a handshake deal and we could have avoided a lot of um, uh, 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 controversy or a confrontation had there been a good attorney involved. So uh, today I was very happy to close a deal for uh, a local business in Fremont. And I just uh, negotiated something in the lease that they're buying the business where because they kept pressing on it, I uh, saved them uh, some money on deferred rent that the other uh, tenant that's vacating had to owe. So those are the kinds of things that if you're not having a good legal team involved, you may miss. So yeah, my name is Dave Bonacorsi. My email is D is in uh, David Bonacorsi, B-O-N-A-C-C-O-R-S-I at 3blawfirm.com. And it's the number three, B is in boy, lawfirm.com. You can reach me at 510-791-1888. And I'm in uh, the Fremont, Newark area, but because of the magic of Zoom and the ability to, to make remote appearances, I do have a uh, practice throughout the Bay Area. Great. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for inviting me. Take care. Bye.